Welcome to the Alt Swift X Game of Thrones Abridged Podcast, episode 98. This is a show where we we analyze and summarize and discuss the Song of Ice and Fire book series chapter by chapter with the utmost possible commitment to professionalism, academic analysis, and conciseness, where we we never waste a word where a word would better be unwasted. Uh, we, we, we are up to book two. We're up to chapter 25 of book two. It is Theon 2, A Clash of Kings. Uh, Theon, in his previous chapter, rolled in home to his ancestral home of Pike on the Iron Islands, hoping to claim his his place as the future king of the Iron Islands. Never mind the fact that he hasn't been to the Iron Islands since he was uh, as tall as a bean. Um, Theon reckons he can just waltz right in and immediately take charge and be respected and loved and embraced by the Ironborn. Uh, and he's... And he's rapidly learning that that's not actually what's going to happen. Well, except he actually kind of isn't, because the whole tragedy of Theon's character is that he never fucking learns. Uh, not at least until it's too late. Theon's a very, like, dislikable character in a lot of ways, because he's just really obnoxious and cold and foolish to people a lot of the time. But also there's this center of, like, sympathetic insecurity that Theon has. Because all he really wants is to be loved, because he grew up with the Starks essentially as a hostage. And he felt like he wasn't fully accepted into that family. So now he comes back to his biological family and his biological people, and he's hoping to be a part of them. Um, but he's too stupid and and young and full of pride and spunk to possibly have the humility and the wisdom to actually like follow through and get anything done. And uh, by the time he by the time he starts to learn and he starts to realize his folly, he's having his bits nipped by Ramsay Bolton in the Dreadfort. So it's it's a deeply tragic tale, is Theon Greyjoy's. Um, but uh, but this is just the beginning. This this chapter is it's basically all incest. Like this whole chapter is just sexual innuendo, one after the other. George is having an enormous amount of fun writing this chapter. Like, every time he makes a, another little joke about masts and cocks and guiding the ship into harbour, you can just you can just see the, the round face of George Martin just giggling into his MS-DOS word processor as he writes this stuff. So, um... So I think that's the best attitude we can bring to this chapter, is just to enjoy the ridiculousness of it, um, it's like comedy. It's like a comedy chapter, is what this is. Uh, but it's it, there's there's a there's a definite layer of tragedy beneath. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about today on Game of Thrones: A Bridge. Thanks so much for joining us. So, the first line is: "She was undeniably a beauty, but your first is always beautiful." Theon Greyjoy thought. So what's happening is that Theon is appraising this ship. Uh, his family has provided him with a new ship for him to sail uh, in their upcoming conquests, uh, the, the plans of which are about to be revealed. And, um, and Theon is, is checking out this new ship that he's got, and of course he's comparing the ship to a woman, because Theon, Theon uses sex metaphors for everything. Sex for Theon Greyjoy is like a surrogate replacement for intimacy and family and connection and all those things that he's lacking, he replaces with sex. Because uh, the only way to fill the hole in your heart is to fill someone else's hole. I'm sorry. This is improvised, so bad things come out. Um, but so, so Theon uses sex as like a way to like understand everything in his life, and now he's appraising this ship as though it were a woman. Your first is always beautiful. And then he's approached by a woman who Theon does not recognize, and we know that this woman is actually Asha Greyjoy, Theon's sister, the daughter of Balon Greyjoy, uh, but Theon fails to recognize her, and so he appraises this woman and he likes what he sees. She's ironborn, she's lean and long-legged, with black hair cut short, wind-shaped skin, strong shore hands, a dirk at her belt. Her nose is big, but her smile makes up for it. She's about 25, no, no more than 25 years old. And I, and I kind of like, like, there is a little bit of a difference between, um, between 
Yara Greyjoy on the TV show portrayed by Gemma Whelan compared to Asha Greyjoy in the um, in the books. I think that Asha having short hair is actually like kind of significant because what's so interesting about Asha is that she's a woman trying to wield power in a deeply patriarchal ironborn society. Uh, like they talk later about how like there are some female ironborn sailors and captains, but like not many. And so Asha really does have to work to like assert her power in this patriarchal society. And you know, and and like Brienne and like Arya and like all these other women trying to fit in this male dominated world, she, th th it's a difficult constant compromise. And so I think I feel like Asha's short hair is one very small, you know, symbol of that because Asha. Uh, you know, doesn't have the long hair of a lady. She has like the shorter hair that a man might have, which I which I feel like is one small detail that's you know maybe lost by having Gemma Wheel and having long hair in the show. But whatever. So, Theon meets Asher for the first time in years and years, and he doesn't recognize her, but she recognizes him, and so she immediately decides to fuck with him. Um, I also think it's kind of interesting that Theon, like, immediately recognizes Asher as Ironborn, um, which is not dissimilar to the previous chapter in Craster's Keep, when Craster immediately recognized Jon as a Stark bastard, uh, just emphasizing, like, the, the, the significance of blood and, like, appearance and, you know, family heritage is such a powerful thing in this world. Um, and so Theon's like, ooh, uh, this ship is a sweet sight, but not so ha not half so sweet as you, honey bunny. And she's like, ooh, I best be careful. This lordling has a honeyed tongue like an anteater on a, on a bender at the honey factory. And then Theon says, taste it and see. Um, so Theon's just immediately hitting really hard on his sister um and just and basically the rest of the chapter is just him like is just this incestuous flirtation um i mean the previous chapter was all incest as well that was craster's keep the the man with all of his daughter wives um and now we have a whole different flavor of incest filling the entire chapter um so yeah if you thought that you know last chapter was good but it, it just didn't have enough incest then i've got good news for you because this is just incest all the way down um so he's talking with Asha and he's hitting on her and he says, Ooh, my cock's gone hard as a mast for you. Um, it's always the, the ship metaphors with George. It's like uh, Samuel Tarly's penis is uh, described as a fat pink mast in book four. George always goes right for the ships um, and swords as well. It's like Brandon Stark uh, with... Um, uh, fuck, what's her name? Barbary Dustin? Like, Barbary Dustin said that Brandon said that a bloody sword is a beautiful thing, referring to, like, a penis with, like, uh, uh, blood on it. Um, so George is all about comparing, like, sex and weapons and warfare with sex. Um, which I think is like, it's all, it's all tied up in like this, you know, masculine chivalric testosterone blood and battle and sex stuff that's all like wrapped up together in, in the brain of, 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 I don't know, men. Um, I think it's a thing, you know, all those, all those like impulsive instinctual feelings are all sort of interconnected on some base level. I'm not Dr. Freud, but I think that's what George is going for here. So, uh, so Theon just complains that he's really hard for her, and she's like, oh, but I'm married, and then Theon's like, nah, you should have sex with me, because I'm a prince, I'm a prince of the Iron Islands, and if you have sex with me when you're really old, you can tell your grandchildren that you had sex with a prince once. Um, which is exactly what everyone wants to hear from their grandma, right? Like, you know, you know, at the, at the Christmas lunch, at, you know, over the Thanksgiving turkey, you really just want to hear grandma just, um, just, just discuss her body count at length is, is what you want to hear. Um, I'm sure some of you probably did <laughs> suffer that <laughs> this holiday season. Um, so, uh, and so Theon's like, oh, you know, you can say that you once loved a king. And Asher says, oh, is it love we're talking now? I thought it was just cocks and cunts. Um, do you remember when... Do you remember when the the actor who played Brother Ray in season six of Game of Thrones, is it 
Shane Mc someone or other or someone famous actor. He played Odin in American Gods. That actor said that you know he like he like just went out and spoiled a bunch of Game of Thrones spoilers in the media, and then people were like, "Why are you going around spoiling the details? People really care about you know this stuff." And then Ian McShane, and then Ian McShane was like, "Oh, you know, why do you care about spoilers, you fucking nerds? It, it's all just tits and dragons anyway." Um, and that was you know became sort of an infamous line, and I feel like if you know. It's a song of ice and fire. You could call it a song of tits and dragons. You could also call it a song of cocks and cunts, because that because that is at least what it feels like in this particular chapter. So Theon is getting really fond of uh, of his sister, not knowing that she's his sister. Um, this is this is sort of Oedipal, isn't it? Because the myth of Oedipus was about a guy who um, unknowingly killed his father and had sex with his mother. Was I think what happened. And there's all this writing about um, Electra complex and eatable complex, and you know, and and so you know, I think you know, if we want to put on our Freud hat, sometimes people say that, oh well, you know, Theon, Theon subconsciously knew that it was his sister, but then he he was trying to bang her anyway, which I would normally dismiss dismiss outright, but like subconscious like repression is a theme in Theon's story like Theon suppresses his entire identity as Theon in book five when he becomes Reek instead like there's the whole chapter where he doesn't even reveal that he's Reek and he's that he's actually Theon in his first chapter in A Dance with Dragons um and there's also that theory about how Theon some people say um he he unknowingly murdered his own children uh, because the miller's wife had those children, and he killed those children in in this book later on, uh, as as like to to say that those corpses were actually Bran and Rickon's, and there's this theory that those children were actually Theon's because Theon slept with the miller's wife, and maybe on some subconscious level he knows um, that he killed his own children. So like, so I I reckon you really, if you wanted to, you could really read into some like subconsciously he knows that what's going on, and uh, you know. Um, just weird incest and murder and all that subconscious weird stuff. I I'm sure you could find it in here if you looked. Um, and so Asha, um, Asha, Asha says that her name is Esgrid and that she's the wife of Sigrun, the shipbuilder. So, so Asha, like, really quite effortlessly just lies and fabricates this whole identity. She's a skilled liar, I think, Asha demonstrates. Um, because, you know, I would assume that she didn't come into this planning to, like, you know take on a false identity and to and to seduce her brother. I don't think this was Asha's plan. I think she just walked into this situation and then realized that Theon didn't recognize her and then just improvised. Um and um and so yeah, Asha really just sort of masterfully plays Theon, just pulls this cruel joke on Theon for the entirety of the chapter. Um and th and 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 yeah, Theon's like, oh, you know, I'm Prince Theon of House Greyjoy. I'm so important, rah, rah, rah. Not knowing that Asher is Balon's preferred heir to the Iron Islands. Asher is the more important person, um, the more important person than Theon in this situation. So it's ironic that he thinks he's in charge of this woman when in actual case she's in the stronger political position at this point. Uh, and so the longship that was built for Theon uh, has that has that new longship smell. It still smells of pitch and resin. It's a lean. It's got it's it's a lean black hull for a hundred feet long. A single tall mast, and a hundred men could get on its decks to pull the oars. And they're like, man, this is a pretty good ship. And Ash is like, yeah, well, it's a good ship for someone who knows how to handle a good ship. And Theon's like, oh, well, it has been a while since I sailed a ship. And he sort of admits to himself in his head that, oh, I've actually never been the captain of a ship. But Theon's like, oh, no, nah, look, but I'm a Greyjoy. I'm an Iron Man. The sea is in my blood. So, like, Theon is trying to, is trying to um, reassure himself that, no, like, it's totally reasonable for me to just walk into the Iron Islands and expect to become the king of this place. No, it's totally reasonable. But Asher, like, throughout the chapter just injects doubt and just sort of, like, prods and questions Theon to sort of go, are, are you sure you really think you can run this place? Because Theon is a political threat to Asher. Asher wants to be the queen of the Iron Islands, um, or at least, you know, the, the lord, the ruler of the Iron Islands. Um, and Theon is a threat to that because he's coming in and wanting to rule it himself. So, so Asher is strategically doing a little bit of reconnaissance by just sort of learning information about what Theon's intentions are, what Theon's situation is. 
Um, and I think she's learning pretty compellingly that he's not a big threat, is what she learns throughout this chapter. Um, and uh, and they name the, the ship Sea Bitch, and um, Theon just talks a whole bunch of smack to try and uh, get her into bed with him. Um, and uh, it, this whole chapter, like, th- it's just lies and horniness is all this chapter is from Theon. Um, they're meant to bless this new ship with seawater from, from Aaron Damper, the prophet, as, as a prayer to the drowned god. But Theon says that he'd rather bless this ship with the milk of my loins and with yours. And Ash is like, I don't know if the drowned god likes your cum, Theon. And then Theon's like, ah, bugger the drowned god. If, it, if he troubles us, I'll drown him again. So, like, goddamn, Theon is just dropping some, like, high-grade heresy right now. Like, like Ash is learning that, oh, Theon does not respect the gods of this land that he wants to rule. So, like, Jesus Christ, like, Theon really is not off to a good start here. Um, so... Uh, so Theon really wants to bang, and uh, and then Esgrid is sort of playing him along, and Esgrid like grabs his he grabs his cock through his pants, the iron outline of his manhood. He is ironborn, so I, I guess that fits. Um, and he invites her to come to the feast at Pike with him. The irony being that uh, Asher is already invited to the feast. In fact, she's on the place. Of, she's on the. She's on the highest place of honor at this feast, next to her father Balon. But Theon doesn't know that. And uh, and they're flirting more. And Asher drops a wicked smile. And uh, and Theon says, "Well, I'd let you be on top if you if I knew that you'd steer me safe into port." And Asher says, oh, I know which end of the oar goes in the sea. There's no one better with ropes and knots. And then she unties his his breeches, the lacing on his breeches, which seems like really inconvenient to me. Can you, can you imagine having to undo laces to like pull your dick out every time you want to pee? That'd be such a nightmare. Um, she says that she's pregnant and she said that she says that she's pregnant with her new husband and Theon just gets more turned on by that. Um, and he invites her to, like, ride on his horse with him on the way to Pike. Um, Asher says she likes to be on top, and Theon is very impressed by this assertive woman. Uh, because he, he had just been sleeping with the daughter of the captain of the Miraham, which was the ship that he took on the way to the Iron Islands in the previous, in his previous chapter. And she was a very sort of, like, passive and slow and sort of dull woman who he exploited regardless um, so he's excited by this fiery, assertive, um, sexually confident woman who who happens to be his sister, um, and and that sort of reminds me of Roz. Like, remember in the TV show, there was this show only character called Roz, who was a sex worker in Winterfell, who Theon had a relationship with. Except she just kind of dumped him halfway through the first season because she was going to King's Landing to make more money there. And um, and that was an interesting relationship because Theon obviously cared a lot about Roz, or you know, well, he didn't he didn't treat her very well, but he he valued that relationship because she was one of the few people who gave him intimacy, um, and she was like you know confident and like you know talked back to him and whatever, and um, it was a fun relationship, and it sort of reminds me of the dynamic between Asher and Theon here. Um, so. Theon's getting real excited, and Ash is like, all right, take me to Pike. Let me see your proud towers rising from the sea. Because that's the other thing that's cocks. Swords are cocks. The masts of ships are cocks. Towers are also cocks. Pretty much everything that men love. <laughs> like, pre- pretty much everything that a red-blooded Westerosi man loves. Uh, you know, weapons and castles and ships. They're all cocks. Um, uh, golf clubs... Uh, root vegetables, uh, baguettes, all of it is cocks, is what George Martin would have you believe. Um, and so Asha walks boldly, part saunter, part sway. Uh, she walks as though she she knows how to walk on the deck of a ship. And they walk through Lordsport, this little town, and, uh, and Theon notices that a lot of the townsfolk and the oarsmen, they grow quiet as they pass, and they acknowledge him with respectful bows of the head. And Theon's all excited. He's like, oh my god, the people of the Iron Islands are finally, they know who I am. They're recognizing my authority. They realize that I'm the prince of the Iron Islands and they're showing me respect. But like the hilarious tragedy is that they're not bowing or respecting Theon. 
they're bowing for and respecting Asher because Asher is is recognized as the heir of the Iron Islands uh, to at least some extent. And Asher is well known and well respected around town. But poor stupid Theon thinks that it's him that they respect. So it's just this whole thing is a farce Um, and a lot more fun on the second read than on the first, I think. We get some description of some of the people and the goings-on in Lordsport. Um, Lord Goodbrother of Great Wick has brought his men around, uh, and they have, they have striped goat's hair sashes, uh, and some, someone called Otter Gimpney has some whores who are being fucked bow-legged by beardless boys in goat's hair sashes, and Theon thinks a poxia den of slattens he hoped he'd never see. So it's all, it's very colourful and bawdy and ridiculous, and I just think George is having a huge amount of fun writing this. Um, there's, a, there's a bloke called Bluetooth, um, and he's a tall man in a bearskin vest and a raven-winged helm. Um, and, and Asher sort of talks and banters with this Bluetooth guy. Yeah, I mean, the, the Ironborn, you know, you get a sense just from this paragraph that they're, they're a diverse, colourful, interesting people. Um, which the show did not capture at all. Like, the show just had every Ironborn in these, like, identical, like, dark green leathery outfits, and they all just look very sort of stern all the time. But in the books here, you know, there's a bit of variety, there's a bit of diversity, there's some colourful costumes, there's some colourful names, there's stuff going on, um, which I think is really great, and something that the show definitely missed out on. Um, and and Bluetooth says that he, he got his new wife pregnant, and so Esgrid says, oh, you sure got your oar in early, and Bluetooth said, aye, and stroked and stroked and stroked, so... Oh boy, the the ships as sex metaphors just don't stop don't stop coming. They 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 start coming and they and they don't stop coming. Oh boy. Um so Theon's like, "Oh, this Bluetooth guy. Oh, should should I have him on my on my new ship as an oarsman?" And Asher says, "Well, no, that would insult him because Bluetooth has has a ship of his own." And Theon's like, oh, yeah, I don't actually know the people here. I don't know who's a good oarsman, who's a good captain. I don't have all these connections that Asher has. Um, and, and he looks for the people that he used to know when he was a child, but all the people he knew when he was a child are all gone or dead or grown up into strangers. So Theon is starting to realize that, oh, I actually don't know any of the people in this country that I'm hoping to be the king of. Um, but Theon just, he, he just doesn't, he, he, he just... He just fails to sort of put two and two together, and he just quickly goes back to his ignorant confidence once again. Whereas Asher, she has the networks. She knows the people. The people love her. So Asher is really well-placed to actually rule here, unlike Theon. So, so you know, Theon basically fails to realize it, but we start to realize through this chapter that Theon's ambitions are delusional. Um, he can't just waltz in here and expect to rule the place, which is a subversion of a fantasy trope, Right? Like, it, it, you know, it, like the Lord of the Rings, the return of the king is about the long lost Aragorn returning to rule the realm. Never mind that he hasn't been there in decades and no one knows who he is. It's just totally reasonable that everyone just goes, oh, well, you know, you've got the right bloodline, so I guess you're king. Like, all good. Um, but there's a subversion of that. You can't just waltz in and expect to become king. You've got to have the political connections. You've got to do the work. And Asher did the work, but Theon has not. Um, and so... Asher, like, knows all these people. She's, like, saying hi to all these people, asking about the kids, you know, asking about, you know, whatever. And, you know, she, she gets along with everyone. She says what's dead may never die. She performs the Ironborn religion. She's well known. Um, and, and Theon's like, oh, well, you know, it doesn't matter that I don't know who, who the oarsmen are. It doesn't no matter that I don't know the people. As long as they're strong to pull the oars, that's fine. But Asher says, well, no, strength is not enough. A, a, a longship's oars must move as one. Choose men that have rowed together before, if you're wise. And so Theon says, oh, sage counsel, perhaps you'd help me choose them. Um, so for a moment, it looks like Theon might actually be being smart and humble for once, but then he thinks in his head, let her believe that I want her wisdom. Women fancy that. So Theon is patronizingly humoring Asher and pretending that he cares about her advice, when her advice actually is far, like, he could benefit from her advice a lot. Um, so, you know, it's just this irony in that Theon thinks that he's, you know, 
he's in control here and he's patronizing Esgrid when in actual fact she's running this show. Uh, and then they walk past the Miraham, which was the ship that Theon came to the Iron Islands in. Uh, and the and the daughter of the captain leans over the rail and like begs Theon to say, "Oh, come, please come and talk to me," um, because what happened was that Theon was having sex with the captain's daughter all the way to the Iron Islands, and then he got off the boat and says, "See ya, I'm not going to see you again." Um, and she's like, "Oh, but I I thought you were going to like keep me in your castle or something or look after me because now that you've gotten me pregnant, probably my my father is maybe not going to keep me and is going to beat me and swear at me and could be horrible to me. So like, you really kind of screwed me over here. Like maybe you could help me out, but Theon just coldly leaves her to her fate. Um, Theon Theon saw the captain's daughter." wandering forlornly around the deck every time he came to the dock and Theon just continues to just coldly ignore her despite the position that he put her in so that that I think is one of the more cruel things that Theon does um in this early part of the book and Asher sees that you know Asher sees the way that uh Theon treats people the way Theon treats vulnerable people um and I don't think she judges him well for it and of course, the Miraham later plays a role in the next book. An entire fat-ass thick book later, the, the captain of the Miraham returns back into the story because the Miraham is currently being kept in the docks at, at the harbour. The, the Greyjoys aren't letting any ship leave the Iron Islands because they, don't, they want to keep it a secret that the Ironborn are planning an attack on the north. Um, and so it's only in book three that the captain of the Miraham gets to leave the Iron Islands and then he turns up at uh, Rob and Catelyn's council and says, hey, you might want to know Greyjoys are up to some shit and Euron Greyjoy has returned. Uh, and so we get this great description of like Euron Greyjoy as, bl- you know, so black a pirate has never sailed the seas or whatever he says in book three. So it's cool that even these tiny, tiny minor characters um, become really significant later on. Um we also meet Wex. So Wex is Theon's new squire. Uh, Wex isn't in the TV show, but Wex is this 12-year-old uh, dumb boy. Dumb not as in unintelligent, but dumb as in he cannot speak. Uh, and he becomes a really important character way over in book five, because Wex uh, comes to Winterfell with Theon, and Wex witnesses Bran and Rickon secretly escaping from Winterfell. So it's Wex who tells uh, Wyman Manderley and uh, fucking... What's his name? Fucking Glover. Rob- Robert Glover. He tells Wyman and Robert that Bran and Rickon are alive, and that sparks Wyman's whole plotline with sending Davos to fetch Rickon on Skargos. So it's incredible how, how these really minor characters in book two become really significant in, like, book five, like, years and thousands of words later. Um, and, I, you know, I'd love to know how much of that is planned by George Martin. Like, when he wrote A Clash of Kings in 1998... Did he know that that Wex Pike was going to turn up four books later to tell about Bran and Rickon, or did he just sort of improvise it as he went along? Either way, it's incredibly um, impressive. These are really intricate books, and I love it. Um, and uh, and yeah, Wex Wex cannot speak, but he's very clever. Um, and so Theon goes and finds Wex at the pub, and 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 he thinks. That if Wex is up with one of those poxy whores, I'll strip the hide off of him. Which is really weird. Like, Theon is implying that he thinks that Wex, the 12 year old boy, might be with one of the prostitutes in the brothel, which seems like a weird thing to assume. There's a lot of weird, like, age stuff in A Song of Ice and Fire. I don't know if George Martin's just kind of dumb, like, doesn't know, like, when kids develop. Like, I don't know, but it's awkward sometimes. Um, Because, come on, 12 years old, Jesus Christ. Um, and Wex sees Esgrid, a.k.a. Asher Greyjoy, and his eyes go round. So Wex recognizes Asher, because everyone knows Asher around these parts, it seems. Uh, and so Wex, the, the, the mute, knows that Theon is feeling up his sister, but, uh, but can't tell him, or chooses not to tell him, tells him, not, doesn't, doesn't warn him. So everyone is in on the bloody joke, except for Theon, throughout this thing. And they get Theon's horse... And, and uh, Asher describes it as a hell horse because it's this big, black, powerful horse. Um, and, you know, in the Iron Islands, most people aren't really into horses because they spend more time in ships than in saddles. Um, some of the poor small folk, they don't even have horses, so they have to pull their own plows, which sounds 
dreadful. Like, being a peasant in Westeros is bad. Being a peasant in the Iron Islands is even worse, I think. Um, and especially, like, the slavery thing. Because that's another thing that the show didn't mention. Um, the, the Iron Islands in the book series have thralls. And thralls are slaves who are, like, captured from raids and stuff. And it's just this completely accepted part of, of Ironborn society that, like, a bunch of people are just slaves and they're just kept to work the fields and do all of the shitty jobs. Um, and that's a reminder that, like, even, like, quote-unquote good Ironborn, like Asha Greyjoy, like, she's still complicit in a, in a society that's based on slavery and, and, and reaving and raving and all of that, so, um, so the Ironborn are pretty fucking terrible, is what I'm trying to say. So this horse, uh, this horse who was called Smiler, because Theon in the early books is known to, to, to smile sort of sarcastically and cruelly quite often, um, that's sort of his defense mechanism. He's always smirking at everything to sort of make himself feel superior. And so his horse is named Smiler. And uh, and, and he says that the animal had fire in its eyes. Uh, which is a bit ominous because in book... Uh, this book? Later on, uh, Smiler gets set on fire when uh, Ramsay Bolton attacks Winterfell and burns the castle. And it's this really horrible, horrible image at the end of Theon's uh, arc in the book where he... Uh, he sees this burning horse, um, and so that fire is foreshadowed by uh, by the by this hell horse with fire in its eyes in this chapter. Um, and so again, but but this also just demonstrates Theon's just uh, poor politics uh, because you know he has this big fancy horse that he's all proud of. But Ironborn, they don't like horses. They don't respect horses. They respect ships. So Theon is just sending all the wrong cultural messages if he hopes to rule this place. Um, and, and, yeah, so Theon's like, I, I called it Smiler because someone once told me that I smile at the wrong things. And, uh, and Asha says, do you smile at the wrong things? And Theon says, well, only by the lights of those who smile at nothing, he says, thinking of, like, um, Aaron, who, uh, famously is not very smiley since he became a prophet. Um... Theon's whole smiling thing, it reminds me of uh, Amos in The Expanse. Specifically, Amos in The Expanse, uh, in, the, in the comic books, the prequel graphic novels that were released for The Expanse, called The Expanse Origins. And this is not a spoiler, it's like a prequel thing. Uh, but Amos in The Expanse comics, um, he had a really bad childhood. Uh, but this thing that sort of gets him through it and helps him sort of survive is that in the TV show, he wears this pin of, like, the face of, like, a sort of a demon thing um, that has this big smile on it. Um, and in the comic, it's sort of got this keep on smiling thing where the, where, the, where the little badge represents, you know, the determination to just keep on sort of trying to be positive, keep on going, no matter how bad things get. And the smile is sort of a false smile, because Amos is not really a very happy person, and Theon is not a very happy person, but they, don't, but, they, but they both have this symbolism of smiling as a way of sort of hiding their trauma and just continuing on, which I think is an interesting um, parallel. Um, smiling to hide the pain sort of stuff. And so Asher and Theon get on Theon's horse, uh, and Theon enjoys the smell of his sister, who smells like salt and sweat and woman, and he puts a hand on her breast, and Asher plucks it away, um, and Theon tells Asher a bunch of stories as they travel to Pike of the men he killed in the Whispering Wood, um, and, and he slides his hand back up to her breast, uh, so again, like, 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 battle and warfare seems to be sort of intertwined with, like, sexuality and lust, all that testosterone sloshing around. It's like in um, in the Blackwater in um, season two, episode nine, and maybe in the books as well. They, I think the Hound talks about this idea of like after a battle, you've got to have sex with a woman because those two things are just interconnected, apparently. Um, and and so Asher is just sort of uh, allowing, or just uh, is well. This sexual stuff is happening, and Asher could sort of say that... Like, she says, oh, you don't want to do that, my lord prince. She doesn't tell him that she's his sister, because she still wants to gain some information out of him. Um, and she says, your squire is watching you. And Theon says, ah, let him. Um, can, can you imagine what Wex is thinking right now? This 12-year-old boy watching the prince of, of the Iron Islands feeling up the princess of the Iron Islands. 
uh, and uh, and not 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 stopping it. Um, and and Theon's like, ooh, you know, I like a strong woman. And Asher says, well, it doesn't look like you like strong women based on the uh, ca- based on the captain's daughter of the Miraham who you were having sex with. And Theon says, oh, you must not judge me by her. She was the only woman on the ship. So she, so Theon is very dismissive and sort of dehumanizing in the way he treats the uh, captain's daughter. Um, and he complains that his father Balon h- hardly welcomed him um, to Pike, even though he's the heir to Pike and the heir to the Iron Islands. And Asher says, are you? She asked mildly. So this is sort of the crux for Asher, is that she she wants to be the ruler of the Iron Islands, and Theon is presenting himself as the heir to the Iron Islands. So this is like the political conflict here that she's trying to strategize her way around. Um, and she says, "Well, you know, I heard that uh, I heard that Theon Greyjoy has a sister." She says, referring to herself subtly. Uh, and Theon dismisses Asher, saying that, ah, you know, she's just a girl who dresses up as a man, but men's garb won't make her a woman. She's got a nose like a vulture's beak and no more chest than a boy. It's interesting that, like, he's identifying that Asher has a big nose and small breasts, and he also noticed that about Esgrid, but he doesn't put two and two together and realize that they're the same people. Um, so, you know, maybe he does subconsciously know. Ooh, Sigmund Freud. Um, and... He does sort of entertain some doubts, like he realizes that sometimes a strong, ambitious uncle will dispossess a weak nephew. So, you know, Victarion and Aeron and even Euron could potentially be threats to Theon's claim on the Iron Islands. But um, he just tries not to think about it. He just thinks that, ah, well, you know, Aeron's drunk on seawater and Victarion is stupid and Euron is gone, so, you know, it's not going to be a problem. It's all fine. Aaron's just obsessed with his god, and Asher says, his god, not yours? And Theon's like, ah, I can make pious noises as required. So Asher's learning that Theon really um, is not a true Ironborn, has not thought this through, does not have the right allies, is not that much of a threat. Um, but she's really sussing that out. Um, Euron Crozai has no lack of cunning. I've heard men say terrible things of that one. So this is one of these really early ominous mentions of um, Euron Greyjoy in the story, long before he actually appears. And, um, yeah, he's he's infamous in every port from Ibn to, to Ashai. He never gave up the old way. Except Euron is even worse than the old way. Like, the old way is like the Ironborn tradition of, like, raiding and reaving and pillaging and taking thralls and salt wives and blah blah blah. But Euron's even worse than that. Like, Euron doesn't respect Ironborn culture, um, he just exploits and perverts any culture, any power, any magic for his own uh, personal gain. Um, he's scarier than the old way, is Euron Greyjoy. Like, Victarion is the embodiment of the old way. Victarion is like w- th- what a good ironborn man is supposed to be. Um, and he's an absolute dingus, which is, you know, a criticism of the ironborn way. And it's a shame that Victarion isn't in the... Um, isn't in the TV show, because Victarion, like, sort of shows you, he sort of shows you what Ironborn are meant to be, which, which makes it more significant when Euron comes in and shits all over it. Like, like, it's not as obvious in the show that Euron is a perversion and a disruption of everything that Ironborn are meant to be. Um, where, because, you know, you can compare that to Victarion in the books. Anyway, um, so, yeah, Theon just sort of starts to realize, like, 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 Asher says that, oh, well, you know, Euron has been away for so long that he'd be half a stranger here on the Iron Islands. The Ironborn would never seat a stranger in the Seastone chair. And for just, for just a little moment, Theon almost twigs, like, Theon almost realizes that, hang on a minute, it occurred to him that some would call him a stranger as well. Ten years is a long while. But he just sort of quickly thinks, ah, no, nah, I've got time to prove himself. He just sort of dismisses the concern. Um, it, it, it is a real boner killer, though, talking about damp air and the crow's eye, and it dampens his ardor somewhat. Um, but then, you know, quickly, Theon goes right back to his arrogance. He says that, well, you know, Balon's not a great man. He's just the father of a great man, calling himself a great man. He's a fucking 20-year-old snotty-nosed kid who's feeling up his own sister. He's not a great man, but he calls himself such. Um, but at the same time, like, for all of Theon's douchiness, for all of Theon's cruelty, for all of Theon's grossness, 
Um, I still can't help but feel some sympathy for him because it's just like it's the arrogance of youth, right? It's like in the uh, a couple chapters back we talked about uh, Catelyn was in King Renly's camp and, and they talked about the Knights of Summer. Because the Knights of Summer are, are the young, ambitious, hopeful people who just want to get out and be king of the world and achieve great things and be a hero and marry the most beautiful woman in the world. Um, which is, you know, that's a romantic, uh, sympathetic ideal, like, you know, wanting to be something. Um, and, you know, Catelyn's response in that chapter is to say that she pities the Knights of Summer because soon winter will come um, and the summer nights will suffer as Theon suffers very soon. So, you know, Theon is an absolute douche, but um, I, I think that I, I find him somewhat sympathetic, which is um, important because it makes his suffering matter. Uh, and suffer he does. And, you know, it also causes us to understand the terrible things that he does, because Theon does terrible, terrible things uh, later on. Um, and so Theon keeps on horning it up with Esgerud. He kisses her lightly on the nape of, his, of her neck, and she pushes him back. Um, and they talk about their mother. Uh, Asher is like, oh, aren't you going to visit your mother? Um, and, uh, you know, it might bring her some peace. Um, but Theon has very little interest in going and seeing their mother. He says, oh, you sound like a woman caring about your, about my mother. Uh, so Theon's very just cold and douchey and dismissive. Um, and it just adds to the incest vibes when, you know, they are unknowingly talking about their, their, their shared mother. Um, uh, Theon doesn't realize that, that his mother is Asher's mother as well. Um, just lots of twisty layers of grossness here. Um, and the fact that Esgrid says she's pregnant excites Theon. He's got a bit of a pregnant woman fetish. Uh, he wants to taste her mother's milk. So uh, we're throwing some lactation into the mix. It's, oh boy, I did warn you, didn't I? This chapter. Um, and they talk about... Uh, Theon tells more stories about the wars that he fought, the, the wolf king that he served, and the golden lion he fights. And so Theon eagerly tells all these tales about the war that he fought in. The war that he fought for the stocks of Winterfell, I'll note, which is not a very good way to... Um, not a very good way to position himself as, like, a king of the Ironborn when he's telling all these tales about how great of a warrior he was for the Starks. Um, and, and, he, and Theon's thinking, oh man, Ash is so easy to talk to. I feel as though I've known her for years. Because, of course, he has known her for years. Because he's, she's his fucking sister. If this wench's pillow play is half the equal of her wit, I'll need to keep her. So, so he's overwhelmingly seeing her value as a sex object, despite the fact that she spent this whole chapter demonstrating that she knows more about the Iron Islands than he does. He's he's not he 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 still doesn't recognize the value of her wisdom. He only sees her value as a sex object. So Theon is not only uh, misogynistic; he's stupid because strategically he could obviously learn a lot from this woman. Um, even if he didn't know he's a sister. So anyway, they finally get to Pike. They finally get home to their ancestral home. And all these dogs run up um, and, and they greet Asher. And Asher happily laughs and wrestles with the dogs as they turn up. They completely ignore Theon. You see all those gifs where, like, you know, all those, like, memes where, like, you know, the soldier comes home from active duty or whatever and goes to, like, embrace the dog, but the dog, like, runs right past the bloke, his owner, and just goes right to the hot dog stand. It's like one of those just absolute taken and L moments where just, you know, no one is welcoming Theon. Uh, them far more excited about Asher. And Asher aims an ineffectual kick at one of the dogs. Um, and, you know, what is Theon Greyjoy's storyline if not for one great ineffectual kick? Um, and then the guy, and, and you know, Theon commands one of the men at the castle and says, hey, I want you to get rid of these dogs and take my horse. But the man completely ignores Theon and turns to Esgrid and says, Lady Asher, you're back. And Theon is like, oh, God. He, he, he stands and gapes at her. Asher, no, she cannot be Asher. And he realizes that this woman uh, is his sister. And he's just speechless. Um, and Th and Asher is grinning. Like, she finds this hilarious. Uh, this is her joke coming to fruition. She was fucking with him the entire time. And she's enjoying it very much. Um, it was just a prank, bro, is what she says, basically. 
Um, and and he's like, why didn't you tell me? And Asher says, well, I wanted to see who you were, and I did. So that was Asher's goal here was to was to learn who what kind of person Theon Greyjoy really was. Because by not knowing that she was her, uh, he was more uh, he revealed more about what kind of person he really is. Um, and it turns out that he's a ignorant, pompous, proud, foolish, horny, horny man child. Um, and so she just sort of mocks him, uh, and then she walks off, and, um, and Theon cuffs Wex on the ear and says, that's for not warning me. Wex, Wex really could have warned Theon, and it's hilarious that he didn't. I, I, I like the Wex relationship, it sort of reminds me of, um, Podrick Payne and Tyrion. Like this, uh, this sort of, um... Sort of a sort of a dodgy squire at first glance, like like you know, Podrick with his stutter and Wex with his no tongue. They both seem like sort of a joke squire, you know, inflicted on them as a as a meme. Um, but both of them prove their value in in the end, both Wex and Podrick. And so anyway, so Theon uh, Theon heads into the castle and he takes some wine and he just sits and just just tries to forget the last few hours. Uh, of feeling up his own sister. She's just going, oh my god, she unlaced my breeches. She said that, and then I said this. He could not have possibly made a more appalling fool of himself, Theon thinks. So for a moment, Theon is, you know, really just deeply embarrassed and ashamed. Um, and and you'd think that that might, that, that could lead in a smarter person to a little bit of reflection, a little bit of reconsideration, a little bit of, you know, humility maybe, but no, Theon's very next thought is, no, she was the one who made me a fool, the evil bitch must have enjoyed every moment of it. So, he just puts all the blame on Asher. He doesn't think that, hey, maybe I shouldn't just feel up random women. Um, no, he blames everything on Asher. Um, it reminds me of, like, you know that moment in The Simpsons when Principal Skinner is going like, um, hmm, you know, this this didn't go the way I thought it would. Um, you know, could it be that I'm out of touch? No, it's the children who were wrong. Like, it's basically that exact moment, um, is that Theon is just completely failing to have any kind of self-awareness in this moment, and he's just blaming the whole thing on Asher. Um... So he just sits and gets drunk um, and just sort of tr- tries to forget and um, and he really blames Asher. I have no place here and Asher is the reason, which is just so incorrect. Like the reason that he has no place here is that he doesn't know the people, he doesn't know the customs. He was brought up in Westeros, not in the Iron Islands. He really just doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. But he just projects all of that onto Asher. And so he goes to the feast, he wears some sort of plain clothes because he's feeling a bit down. He doesn't wear any jewellery because he doesn't have any jewellery that he that he killed for by paying the iron price. Um, and uh, he does think that, well, I did kill those wildlings, but they didn't have anything worth taking. That's my cursed luck. I kill the poor. Like, Jesus Christ, Theon feels sorry for himself because the people who he's killed weren't rich enough to have good loot to take. It's such a gross line. I kill the poor. Feel sorry for me, because the people who I kill are poor. Theon fails to have any sympathy for the wildlings who he killed. Theon fails to have any sympathy for the captain's daughter who he had sex with and sort of exploited and put in a bad position. And he has no sympathy for Asher, whose rights he's trying to trample on. Um, He's just really, really selfish um, and lacks empathy. Um, And so he enters the hall for the feast. It's full of ironborn. Uh, there's harlaws and black tides and spars and merlins. Merlin is a funny name for an ironborn house. Salt cliffs and botleys and winches. And all the slaves, the thralls, are pouring drinks. And a bunch of ironborn are playing the finger dance, which is a game where you throw axes at each other and you try to catch them without cutting your fingers off, which is what usually happens in the end. Like, oh my god, the ironborn are ridiculous. Um... That's their idea of a good time, is risking dismemberment. Uh, and Balon Greyjoy, Lord Balon, is sitting on the sea stone chair. The throne of the Ironborn is carved in the shape of a great kraken from an immense block of oily black stone. Legend says that the first men found this, found this throne already standing on the shores of Old Wick. So who built this mysterious oily black stone throne? Was it built by the Lovecraftian Deep Ones? Was it built by the Great Empire of the Dawn from Ashai? 
Was it built by the Grey King? Was it like ancient aliens? Dot JPEG, basically. Um, and and Theon walks in, and Lord Balon says, "Ooh, you you came late to the feast, Theon Greyjoy," which is actually really interesting because in book five, I think. Asher realizes that there's this precedent in Ironborn history where there was a king's moot where, like, the, the heir to the... or, like, one of the potential candidates to be the king of the Iron Islands didn't come to the king's moot because he was late. He was held up by something. And because this candidate wasn't at the king's moot when they voted for the next king, that king's moot was deemed invalid retroactively because because Theon the latecomer or, or Torgon the latecomer or whatever his name was, he came to the election too late. And because he was late and he wasn't there, they say, well, we've got to do the election again. And then they chose him as king or something. Uh, that's what Asher realizes in book five. And it's sort of set up as something that might be a big deal. The theory is that maybe Euron's kingship of the Iron Islands will be deemed invalid because Theon wasn't there to contest it. And so it's really interesting that they're saying now in book two, you come late, Theon. Maybe that alludes to this whole sort of Torgon the latecomer theory that comes up later. Um, and so Theon rolls in and he finds Asher sitting in the seat next to Balon, which is where the heir belongs. And Theon says to Asher, you're in my place. And Asher says, brother, you are mistaken. Your place is at Winterfell. So that's the simple truth that Theon is failing to get through his thick head. Um, he doesn't belong here on the Iron Islands because he doesn't know this place. He doesn't know the people. He doesn't know the culture. He doesn't believe in the religion. He doesn't belong here. And yet he's trying to force himself to be here. And I, and I mean, you know, the sympathetic reading is that the reason why Theon is so desperate to be part of the Iron Islands is because he didn't feel accepted at Winterfell either. So Theon is in a rock and a hard, between a rock and a hard place emotionally. Um, but he is not adapting to the situation very well. Um, so they sort of, you know, joust and sort of um, jab at each other. Um, and Asher says, ooh, you know, I bet your sea bitch can't keep up with my black wind, which is the name of her ship. Uh, are you going to drink wine tonight? Or is it my mother's milk you thirst for? So she's really like... Twisting the screws with Theon. She's really making the most of uh, the cruel joke that she played on him. Um, and they eat the feast. So we've got a food description. There's a loaf of bread. There's a trencher. Fill it up with fish stew. And Theon tastes the fish stew, though not the fish stew that he had hoped to taste earlier. Uh, that, that was bad. And... Um, and Asha admits that, you know, Esgrid, the name Esgrid that she made up earlier, that was the name of the ship that Sigrun built. She didn't actually marry anyone. She's not actually pregnant. That was just the lie that she came up with. And I think, you know, Asha's a good liar, which I think might contribute to why Asha's a good politician, you know? Like, Asha, Asha is, is sharp and smart, and she can manipulate people, which is how she, you know, does pretty well at the King's Moot, but not as well as Euron Crozai does. Um, so she, so Ash is just trolling the fuck out of Theon, um, and, you know, Theon's sort of having a go at her, so Asha stands on the table and says, Rolf, here, and then Rolf throws an axe at her, and then Asha catches the axe, and then plunges the axe into Theon's soup, and says, this axe, that's my lord husband, and then she pulls a dagger out of her breasts, and she says, and here's my sweet suckling babe. And, like, everyone in the hall laughs and, like, smiles and, like, celebrates Asha being just badass and theatrical. You know, she's a politician. She's a player. She's charismatic. She has everything that Theon doesn't have. Um, so she's really having a great time here. And it just feels like this this great theatrical declaration of Asha's strength and pride and autonomy and rejection of, like, the female gender role that she might be forced into. Asha's really declaring her power here because she's hoping to become the ruler of this land. Um, I do wonder, though, like, like, did Asha plan this with Rolf? Did she say, hey, in the middle of this feast, I'm going to say, Rolf, axe, throw it to me. Um... Did they, like, rehearse that? Did they practice that? Or, or, like, like, does Rolf throw an axe at Asher every time he, she says Rolf here? I feel like there's dangers in that, but, you know, I'm not going to question the choreography. Um, so, you know, everyone's celebrating Asher, um, and, and then Theon just sort of sits down with his soup splattered over his shirt and says, We will see who is laughing when all this is done, bitch. 
So the word bitch is really the last resort of the humbled man. R- really, really, when 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 a dickhead's got no other options, you just you just call someone bitch as the last, the last way to retain the last scrap of pride you have is to is to do that. I think. Um, and and even then, like Asher says to Theon, hey, you know, you do well to heed what I told you about choosing a crew. If you had learn, if you had troubled to learn the first thing about Sigrun, I wouldn't have fooled you with my lie. Ten years a wolf, but you land here and think to prince about the islands, and yet you know nothing and no one. Why should men fight and die for you? So Asher just really concisely says, Theon, you got no place here. You can't hope to rule this place. You're being an idiot. Um, and yet Theon just refuses to listen. Half my life I have waited to come home, and for what? Mockery and disregard? And so Theon just doesn't let it go. And they have more food, there's fish stew and black bread and spiceless goat, which is inferior to spiced goat, of course. Um, and then Balon Greyjoy... Well, well yeah, so, so, so Theon's feeling really bitter and resentful about, you know, not being welcomed and, and acclaimed in the Iron Islands. Basically, it's the problem of Theon's dreams and hopes and ambitions and fantasies failing to re- fa- failing to match reality, which is exactly the same thing that happens to Sansa and her songs and Brienne and her ideals of knighthood and Jon of and and his ambitions and hopes for for adventure with the Night's Watch and Renly with his hopes of kingship. All of these characters have these I- idealized, optimistic hopes of what their world and their life is going to be like, but. The world does not match that reality, and it comes crashing down like a cold, wet blanket on their dreams. Um, that's what A Song of Ice and Fire is all about. It's about it's about subverting and undermining the, the fantasy dream of King Aragorn ruling wisely for a hundred years, and the heroic prince with the noble blood. All of that is undermined and questioned and deconstructed by A Song of Ice and Fire. It's a response to like the optimism of The Lord of the Rings, with the deep, dark cynicism of Westeros. So... Um, Theon smack talks his uncle some more, um, and uh, Balon goes off to to meet with the important Ironborn, um, and Theon says, I run after no man, but Asher says, well, no man, but every woman, you bloody skirt-chasing nincompoop. Um, and Asher mocks Theon more for, like, hitting on her. She's, just, like, she's really, like, punishing him for that, for that whole affair. Um, and... Theon says, well, it's not my bloody fault. I'm a man, so of course I'm going to sexually assault people. What sort of unnatural creature are you? And Asher says, hmm, only a shy maid, and reaches for his cock again. So she's really, like, messing with him. And she's also playing on her, like, you know, gender identity thing. Because, you know, she's her suckling babe is a dagger and her husband is an axe. She's really, like, wielding her gender nonconformity around like a weapon. And she And she turns that weapon against Theon to you know, prevent this pup who's trying to displace her as heir to the Iron Islands. And so Theon's feeling real horrible. He um, he says, marriage is not for you. I'm going to pack you off to the Silent Sisters when I'm king. Which is like, you know, get thee to a nunnery in um, Romeo and Juliet. But like, you know, even even Theon talking about the Silent Sisters is not a very Ironborn sort of thing, because there's not a lot of Faith of the Seven on the Iron Islands. So, you know, everything Theon does is just failing to be in keeping with Ironborn values. But nonetheless, he... he persists in all his ignorance and arrogance. Um, and so he goes to the meeting with Balon, uh, and Victarion is there, and Aeron is there, and... Um, and and as he, as Theon goes to the meeting across the bridge, he clutches the ropes of the bridge, uh, pretending that it was Asher's neck that he was tightly gripping. So all of his aggression is directed at Asher. There's no like internal reflection and, and questioning going on here. Theon is uh, really just not not thinking very well. And he goes in, and Balon Greyjoy, Lord of the Iron Islands, is like, "All right, I've made my plans. It is time that you heard them." you know, plans, such as they are. Um, and he says, here's the plan. Um, we're gathering the men together, and tomorrow we're gonna sail, uh, and Theon, you're gonna take eight ships to harry the Stony Shore. It's like a minor raid as a distraction so that we can, uh, get our other ships in to attack the north. And Theon is immediately outraged and says, oh, what can I hope to accomplish with only eight ships? Um, so really just arrogant and ridiculous, 
Um, Dagmar Clefjaw is going to be coming, so Theon's command will be purely nominal. So they're just giving him, like, an easy job and someone else will be in charge, just to just sort of test Theon out, which seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do for Balon, given, given that Theon is, you know, not a known quantity. They don't know if they can rely on Theon. Spoiler, they probably can't rely on Theon. Um, so they give him this minor job, but Theon is outraged that he doesn't get the most important one. Asher, my daughter, Lord Balon goes on, will send 30 ships to Deepwood Mott, which is the castle of the Glovers, uh, and you'll capture it, and uh, it'll be great. And so Asher smiles like a cat in cream and says, I always wanted a castle. Then take one. Uh, and then the most important job is going to be to capture Moat Kaelin. Um, and Moat Kaelin is going to be attacked by Victarion, the Iron Captain of the Iron Fleet, uh, and once we have Moat Kaelin, we'll control the north, because no one will be able to come in through Moat Kaelin from the south, so we're going to take over the north. Um, and Balon, Balon's ambition is to uh, is to hold the north, and the rest will be ours, forest and field and hall, and we will make the folk our thralls and salt wives, and the drowned god will spread his dominion across the green lands. Um, so, so just to be clear, like, Balon's ambition is, is nothing less than to take over the largest of the Seven Kingdoms, um, all of its people, all of its lands, to turn all of its men into slaves and turn all of, it, all of its women into sex slaves, is essentially what he's saying. Um, this is a dark and terrible vision that Balon is, is painting here. It's a bit like, uh, the, you know, cause this all harkens back to the old days. The Ironborn are obsessed with their old way, the way things used to be when the Ironborn were powerful and they raved and raided. Because once upon a time, this Ironborn called Harren Hor uh, took over a big chunk of Westeros. He took over, like, the Riverlands and, and other bits, and he built the great castle of Harren Hall. So, like, you know, the, the Ironborn dream of going back to those good old days of raiding and raping and conquering and burning all over Westeros, and that's what they want to... That's what, they, that's, that's what they want to bring back. Um, which, you know, is a terrible, horrible goal. But but even, you know, even if we accept that goal, th there's like a few steps of working out missing from Balon's plan. Like, it's just sort of like, if we, t if we take... If we take Deepwood Mott and Moat Kaelin, then we will have conquered the North. Uh, no? No. Like, he says that, oh, you know, like, if we just hold those places, like, Winterfell will be under siege, and, like, eventually Winterfell will give up, because, like, most of the northern soldiers went south with Rob Stark, so, like, there won't be enough men to, like, you know, repel us. But, like, the north is big. There's a lot of people in the north. Uh, and the Iron, the Iron Islands are small, and there's not many people in the Iron Islands. I don't think that the Ironborn can reasonably hope to hold on to all of the north. Um, with just this plan. It's absurd. Like, the North aren't going to accept them. Especially especially when their plan is to, like, utterly conquer and enslave everywhere in the North. You think the North is just going to accept that? It's not a very realistic plan, and so it fails miserably in the later books. Um, and, you know, indeed, it's it's Theon Greyjoy himself who retakes Moat Caelan for the North, for the Boltons, later on. And, you know, God, if only Theon knew how bad that was going to get soon. Um, but it's also interesting that, you know, Balon says that, oh, you know, Winterfell will, will respond after my sons have struck their blow. Balon Greyjoy mentions having multiple sons, and what he means is Theon and Asher. Balon refers to Asher as one of his sons, which is really interesting because it sort of shows, you know, A, how Asher is sort of treated as a man for the purposes of Ironborn society, but it also shows that, you know, if Asher is a son to Balon, then she is Balon's heir ahead of Theon, because she is older than him. So, you know, that's that's what's at stake here between Asher and Theon. Theon wants to be wants to rule the Iron Islands, but Balon considers Asher to be to be his uh, you know, eldest son. Um, and Theon also complains that, you know, it doesn't make sense to send Asher to Deepwood and him to the Stony Shore, because Theon knows Deepwood Mott. He knows the Glovers, because when he was with the Starks, he visited the Glovers at Deepwood Mott. So, like, you know, it does make, like, Theon, act like, one of the few ways that Theon actually could be useful is that he knows the North, and he knows the people of the North. Um, and it's really foolish that Balon doesn't get advice from Theon on this. Like, earlier, Theon says, oh, you know, I've got suggestions, I've got plans here, uh, but Balon says, quote, when I require your counsel, I shall ask for it. So Balon is also fucking ignorant by not listening to Theon. 
Um, so the Ironborn, like, basically except for Asher, like, most of the Ironborn are just ignorant and and testosterone fueled, and they just want to conquer and burn, all for the sake of this bygone era of, you know, when the Ironborn were, were supposedly great and powerful. Let's just make the Iron Islands great again, is what Balon and wants, and Victarion wants. And it's just this empty, self-destructive philosophy that gets the Greyjoys defeated again and again and again, like when they rebelled before and they got totally stronked out by Robert and Barristan and and Tywin and all the boys destroying them in the Greyjoy Rebellion like like 10 years ago or whatever. But but the, but the, but the Ironborn just failed to adapt, they failed to make better choices and and Theon Theon does too. Um so so Theon leaves this meeting uh, dissatisfied with his role in this conquest, dissatisfied with, you know, being tricked by Asher and having that whole embarrassing thing, and just everything is just going wrong, and he's a bit drunk, and he's unhappy, and he goes across the bridge, and he, and he stumbles to his knees when there's a sudden gust of wind. And Asher comes along and helps him rise, and and she guides him across across the bridge, and she actually, you know, takes a moment to look after her little brother. And Theon says, I liked you better when you were Esgrid. And Asher says, eh, that's fair. I liked you better when you were nine. So, you know, it, it's an actual kind of, like, it's a tender moment of, like, Asher being nice to Theon and just sort of remembering their past, but also just bitter at, you know, how things have changed. Um, and it's just a shame that circumstances ha- have alienated Asher and Theon when, you know... When they could have been allies, they could have been friends, they could have been real siblings, rather than rather than political rivals and and in this incest farce and just on this self destructive train to nowhere. Choo choo, motherfuckers! You know, SS Greyjoy heading for oblivion. Uh, last stop, Euron's Eldritch Apocalypse. <laughs> like that's that's kind of what's going on here, and uh, all of the all of the pieces are getting set for disaster later on. So, um, so how far will Theon go in pursuit of his ignorant, foolish ambitions? What will it lead him to do? Um, and what horrors will he face when, when he reaches the inevitable, horrific end, uh, end point of his ambitions? And, uh, where will the Ironborn people end up? And will Asher chart a course out of that horror and destruction. Is it possible that the Ironborn have a future apart from just burning and incest and the finger dance? Let's hope so. Alright, so thank you so much for listening to this episode of Game of Thrones Bridge with Alt Swift X. This was episode 98. We're doing episode 99 next, and uh, I can't wait. Uh, next chapter is a Tyrion chapter, Tyrion 6. So uh, get excited. Uh, smash that motherfucking like button. Uh, Isaac Cruz says, notice me, Alt Shift Senpai, in the live chat. Uh, consider yourself noticed, Isaac Cruz. Thanks, everyone, for joining in the live chat. Um, we got 128 live viewers. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of nuts. So uh, thank you all for joining. Um, there's a link in the description if you want to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That'd be nice. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast and to the YouTube channel. And uh, otherwise, uh, keep it loosey goosey and uh, have a good one. Happy, uh, yeah, happy New Year's. Happy 2020. Let's hope that 2021 is uh, less, less of a car crash. That's what I'm hoping. So uh, thanks for listening, guys, and have a good one. Cheers. <laughs>